All right, hi everybody. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sara Najem, who is a computational uh, physicist and uh, works uh, a lot on network systems, which uh, we actually work on some of those topics together because it's related to graph theory. So I'm very happy to introduce Sara, who's also a CAMS fellow and will be talking to us about network complexity from living cells to urban systems. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Ahmed. That was a very, very elaborate <laughs> introduction. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, and as Amr said, I'm going to talk about network complexity. And I thought I'd start my landing slide with uh, Escher's metamorphosis to spare me a lot of explanation on complexity. <laughs> so you see things or one thing that all these things have in common is some sort of organization or self-organization. So this is a big theme of complexity and that pretty much does everything about complexity in the title, <laughs> one way or the other. But I'll move to the network part of the uh, title and I'm gonna try to be seated just for the camera. So it's not my favorite energy level. Um, I'm to have a mouse. Okay, so I'll start by introducing networks through networks of, of uh, knowledge. Though this might seem a bit tautological that I'm you know, using networks to explain something about networks, but it's just a, a, an evidence of how ubiquitous networks are. And more so uh, before the end of the talk, and I hopefully will be engaging your brain network, hopefully till the end, uh, I'll try to convince you that we're pretty much formed of networks and whatever we put to the world are networks and we kind of study them through networks. So what we have here on the slide is a couple names who contributed to network science one way or the other, uh, them being mathematicians, physicists, so social scientists, uh, uh, writers, uh, uh, amateurs. And it's fun because the ideas have diffused over this network and as we're gonna see, produce the whole field uh, of uh, network science. So things have started with Euler and I'm gonna start with graph theory and I'm gonna somehow blur the uh, difference between what a network is and what a graph is just for the sake of uh, cohesiveness of the group. So a famous problem was that of uh, the seven bridges of Konigsberg. So there was this town which has the, had these seven bridges. And the question was like, can one cross all seven bridges and never cross the same one twice? So it was, you know, something that is uh, people were thinking about and, you know, starting to draw a path and never having solutions to that. It was not before uh, Euler's contribution to uh, looking or changing the uh, uh, lens through which the problem was seen and casting it as a graph uh, theoretic problem. So, and his observation was very neat. So on the sides of the bridges, he introduced a node and the node is connected to the node on the other side of the bridge and so on and so forth. And you can see there's this you know, diagram of connected stuff across the sides of the bridge. And uh, this diagram is what we call uh, a graph or, of things connected to each other or in our uh, uh, words or our, our phrasing, we, we call them a network. And the number of things that are connected, we call them nodes. So the A's and the B's and the C and the D's are nodes. So in this case, we have just four of them. And the number of links that connect uh, these nodes are called edges or links. And they could be directed, so they can be just moving one direction with no other in the, in the opposite direction. These we call them directed graphs. And uh, they could be undirected, so that, you know, the direction can be both ways and you know, with no sense of reference to either. So, and you can see that if you pick uh, a node, it has, you know, whatever is lit up on the screen are the Edge, are the edges connecting it to the other nodes. So they come with different uh, number of edges. They're not you know, homogeneously distributed in terms of uh, uh, their degree. So a degree is the number of connection that each node has. Okay, so this 
uh, lens through which uh, Euler has start, started seeing the problem is what you know ignited this this whole uh, you know graph theory and and, and more more so prob random matrix theory theory and so, and on to be uh, called network uh, and the way the way you know you cast this graph into a mathematical object it's a matrix and this matrix has these uh, rows which each row corresponds to a node and each of the corresponding uh, elements of the row correspond to a connection. So let's say I pick up a node number one, it's connected to node two, connected to node three, connected to node four. So these encapsulate the connections between the different components of the graph. And you can see um, we have zeros on the diagonal. So these, there are no self, self edges, so no loops. So these are the mathematical objects which you represent graphs. And earlier solution was, uh, you know, the statement of that problem was there's, there, can, there cannot be a path on a graph that has more than two nodes uh, with odd number of links. So, and he showed it mathematically and, you know, put an end to the uh, problems with the mayors and the municipality and whatnot. It's unsolvable. It's, it doesn't have a solution. So, uh, and in that, uh, uh, statement or solution, uh, there's this link now with structure and whatever you can do with networks. So, and structures or uh, topologies of networks tell us how, you know, complex uh, the networks are and what kind of problems can be solved on them or what kind of problems are impossible to solve. So, and when we say topolo top topological measures or topological properties, I'm going to start by defining a couple. So we have what we call the clustering coefficient, which is a measure of uh, transitivity or how triangular relations are. So let's say uh, I have a friend called C and I have another friend called F. If F and C knew each other, then that's a triangle and that's a transitive relation, okay? But since they don't, they have, have a zero clustering coefficient. So there's no, there's no transitivity in relations, okay? And distance between, uh, a and B is one, I'm connected. So there's a link between us. And A and C is one. So there's no link between B and C. There's an indirect connection going through A. So the distance between B and C is two, okay? Uh, in this case, we have uh, a fully somehow connected network. You can see if I focus on C, uh, C is connected to B. C is connected to D and so is D connected to B. So here we have transitive relations and the clustering coefficient is one. And the distances are, as you see, they're one. Everyone is connected to everyone through one connection. So the, these clustering coefficient and average path lengths are uh, part of what we call topological measures of networks. <laughs> so with Euler's contribution, there's, there's a full legacy and you know, this, this, the the inception of graph theory and all sorts of cool problems on uh, graphs and like escape path and maze and uh, special move on, on checkerboards and so very very nice uh, problems in in graph theory. But then uh, once we know how to you know play with these uh, objects that are called graphs, we reached a stage where we started asking these quintessential questions about how do these networks come about? You know it's put aside their properties, but how do they come about and form? So Erdos and Rainey, at the same time, Gilbert has have put together a sort of generating scheme for what we call random networks, which combines graph theory and probability theory. And their goal was to, you know, put up a model that um, can explain the emergence of graphs or the emergence of these uh, networks that we see. So the idea is simple. You start with, uh, so you start with these uh, unconnected nodes. So I decide I have 20 people in the, in the, in the room and they're not connected to each other. Uh, and I start changing what we call the probability of making a link. So with zero probability, no one knows no one knows anyone. And then I start increasing this probability. So that's the probability of an edge existing between nodes. Okay, so as you see, the network as uh, 
you know, the probability increases, you start seeing like a fully, you know, dense structure in, on the left. And what I'm showing here is something that we call a degree distribution. So this, if I look at an, an individual uh, node, you can see that this is, this has four links, right? So it has degree four, uh, five, five. Yes, five. Yeah. Uh, this has degree four, this has degree one, this has degree one. So there's a distribution of degrees. It's not uniform, right? And uh, what we see here is something that you should somehow be familiar with. It's like more of a Poisson. And let's see why. We have N nodes and we decided that there are K links between them. And there are N choose K ways of putting these links between these N nodes, right? And the probability of a link existing is P and there are K of them, so P to the power K. And the rest should not be connected. So that's one minus p to the power n minus k. So the distribution is uh, that of a look, binomial or a Poisson uh, in the large n limit. And this is a very important property of random networks that they have this uh, kind of this degree distribution. And this is Erdos and Rainey's construction scheme. And it is egalitarian in the sense that there is no preference for a link existing between any of the nodes. Okay, there is no pre any, any way of preferring a node over the other. So links are just thrown in the, among the uh, individuals and uh, we form a network. So what kind of questions uh, this construction can now start uh, uh, answering? Let's start with what we call the giant component. And to make it a bit clearer, I'm gonna put us in a setting where we have, let's say a, a party or a, gathering or a maulid <laughs> of a hundred people and you know people started gathering and instead of them you know uh, mingling together in like groups of 50 they would start you know talking to each other in groups of three or four and you start seeing you know 30 or 40 groups of three or two or whatever and then you would ask a question okay if i tell it if i tell a secret how far, how long should I wait for everybody to know uh, that secret? Okay. And the rule is that, you know, of course, in social gathering where you know no one, you just, you know, you get bored with people and you start moving around. And so you don't spend much time with people and you start, you know, getting acquainted with the, with the, with the crowd. And, but if you were to uh, meet every single person and, you know, uh, spread the, the secret, it would take you like 16 hours, way beyond uh, the, uh, the party's time. So, and Erdos and Rainey said, no, it's not like 16 hours. It's way, way less because, you know, because of this boredom effect, uh, you start on moving and uh, uh, meeting other people, it takes you around 30 minutes. But, okay, the first thing that is important is that timing, you know, the time for, uh, it takes for the secret or the rumor to spread in the network. And there's a critical element that everybody should at least should have at least met one person in the in the party, and this one invitee, or at least a connection with one invitee, is what it's called the percolation threshold. So you should know at least one person, or you should have interacted with at least one person in the party, for the uh, secret to spread in 30 minutes. Okay, so that's what we call a giant component. And think about it in disease context. Like how much would it take for the disease to you know, spread among people? How much would it take for a rumor to spread among the crowd? Uh, so the important thing is that you know, this one link would make the dynamics of whatever you're following into a non-breakable uh, network of communicating clusters. So other questions can be asked. You, know, you can ask the number of people that are a distance D away from me. So I'm a distance zero from myself. I have K a distance one from me, k squared, a distance two from me. And you know, you can go up to distance d. So this distance, if you, you know, take the large n limit uh, and just, you know, simplify you would, you, and get the logarithm of this, you would find that the distance k is like a logarithm of n over a logarithm of the degree. And this is also a very important aspect of random networks. So in, in random networks, the distance k is as a logarithm of the number of people involved. Okay, so this is how far things can move. Uh, there's also another important property of these uh, random networks is that their clustering coefficient 
uh, scales is one over n. The degree, the average degree, so if I'm a person and then there are n minus one people in the room and I can make a connection with the probability p with them, then the average degree is just p times n minus one, right? And for k equal one, which we agreed to be uh, the percolation threshold for the giant component to form, you see that there's a p critical beyond which you see this giant component forming. So everybody somehow is connected to everybody, all right? So if you have a p that is lower than this p critical, you don't have a giant uh, component forming. So these problem, these kind of questions of that form uh, started being answered in this uh, uh, past uh, the uh, inception of the random uh, network uh, construction by Erdos and Rain. So I will ask a question of whether, uh, this is just graph theory, <laughs> well, or is it, I mean, these are things that have been on the table since the 1700s, so why talk about uh, network science? And to answer the question, I'm gonna talk to you about some seemingly unconnected uh, chains of ideas, and then hopefully at the end, close it back to why network science is a somewhat of a standalone uh, theory. So uh, it will start with uh, a, a, a short story by the name of Chains by Karitki, who is a hung Hungarian uh, writer. And uh, he puts this uh, uh, short story in 1929, uh, about uh, how we can connect to any person on the planet with an average of five degree, okay, uh, five connections. So he starts with, you know, entertaining himself with, you know, reaching a Nobel Prize laureate with, you know, three to four steps. And, you know, he mentions that he can do that because uh, the novelist must know King Gustav, which is the, who is the Swedish monarch, who who is the one who hands out the Nobel Prizes, who happens to play tennis with his best friend. So... Three steps, he's there. Yeah. And, <laughs> but, you know, that's a, that's a funny, you know, novel that people, you know, started playing the game uh, and took it kind of seriously. And, and a very renowned sociologist in, in 1967 by the name of Stanley Milgram took it really literally. And uh, he started doing the test and he chose like uh, two people, one in Boston and one in uh, Massachusetts and in, in Sharon, Massachusetts as targets and asked random people in Nebraska and Kansas, Kansas to send mails to these target people. And to somehow chronicle the itinerary of the message. So the first person sends it to someone and that someone you know, has to you know, keep track of whomever uh, was in the way. And finally, the number was 5.5 uh, on average. So that's kind of a funny finding from sociology. Um, a bit later than uh, this, you know, there's, there's, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you about this, whatever was brewing uh, in science fiction and somehow social science, and you're going to see that some science fiction had affected the uh, this network, network science in ways, in funny ways. Uh, there's, there's also another uh, sociologist who was uh, thinking about how important uh, weak ties are to our social uh, interactions. So, you know, how we land jobs or how we, you know, choose people we collaborate with. He had this very uh, nice analogy from classical chemistry that, you know, hydrogen bond is a weak bond, but it keeps water molecules together. So unlike, you know, this uh, uh, Erdos and Rainey's, you know, random connections, uh, he had this notion of close knittedness, but at the same time, there, there's these weak ties that I know someone, there's an acquaintance of mine, who's an important acquaintance in helping me, you know, land a job or uh, find my way to, I don't know, uh, a burger place, Shubhadrafne. But anyhow, there's, you know, these weak ties that are important in uh, the way we lead our life. And they're crucial in what we call the, the communica communication with the outside world. So because friends, they kind of move in the same circle and you need someone outside the circle to connect with others. So that's kind of a different view to that of Erdos and Rainey's completely random uh, construction of, uh, of social networks in one way or the other. 
Now past this, and I think we fast forward to uh, maybe the 90s and beyond, uh, Watts and Strogatz, Watts was a student at Cornell and Strogatz was a professor uh, on linear dynamics, uh, were asking questions about synchronicity. Uh, and they were wondering how is it that the brain cell coordinate and like uh, 10,000 order of magnitude pacemakers of the heart also keep on, you know, beating without the conductor and like how do fireflies fire in unison? So these were questions that were kind of keeping them very uh, occupied. And they started this experiment on the chirps of the snowy tree uh, cricket. So, you know, Watts was on the field listening to this daily, you know, trying to be inspired by, you know, the sounds of the crickets to figure out how is it that they're, they're doing it together. You know, they're just like uh, keeping the sounds and doing the chirps together. And he remembered uh, a conversation that he had with his father about this uh, novel, Chains, about the six degrees, and thought, oh, what is it? How, how fun would it be if these, you know, uh, crickets were kind of communicating in a network which has six degrees of separation? So it was, you know, a, a funny epiphany that they wanted to put it to test. And before, you know, they tested on real data because data was scarce at the time. Uh, they thought about, you know, the, its repercussions, you know, on disease spread, on market dynamics, and, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you abstract away the crickets, they're no longer important. It's the question is, what happens if our interactions are uh, more of a small world interactions? And to their surprise, there was this knowledge gap that no one had paid attention to the structure of networks. So they came about, they came out with the construction of networks which uh, uh, somehow um, have the property of small worldness. So we are kind of uh, moving in small circles. So we know each other's, but there's this one link, which uh, I have a friend, let's say in Mexico, who knows a friend, I don't know, back in China. So these are, you know, these weak ties that uh, were introduced earlier, they're long in the sense that they're you know, not in the closed circle. And they have these effects on uh, both these topological measures, the clustering coefficient and the average path length. Let me try to show you in what way. So that's again, I'm starting with the net with nodes uh, on, a, on a ring topology and every node is connected to its nearest neighbors with K connections, okay? And I start doing a rewiring process. That is, I keep one end of the edge at one node and I flip a coin and, if, and it lands uh, uh, an end, okay? And it could reach all the way, all the other end of the network in one way or the other. So in that sense, for low probabilities, if you can see, for low rewiring probabilities, the clustering coefficient, which is a measure of transitivity or Triangle, triangular relation is kept high because I'm not messing up with the network as a whole. I'm just, you know, rewiring few of the edges, a few of the edges. But its effect, which is tremendous, is on what we call the average path lengths. Because now I no longer need to, you know, if I want to hop from here to here, I don't need to do the hops one by one. I can. There's a there's a direct link from here to the to the other end of the network. So my average path lengths have dropped tremendously. And that is a property of small worldness. That is, uh, transitivity is kept, okay, but at the same time, you know, these weak long ties are introduced. And I now uh, can communicate with the other end of the network uh, with high speeds in a sense, right? But this has a very, ha very harsh repercussions if I say, if a, net if a disease is spreading on a small world network, then few clicks, the disease would reach, let's say, uh, from Wuhan all the way to, let's say, New York, or you know, because there are these long-ranged uh, nodes, uh, long-range edges, and that's how the average path length drops. You know, you don't you know, you don't need to you know move one step at a time from Wuhan to uh, let's say New York. There's one link that takes you takes you there, and you can infect. So. Now they have a theory and they wanted to test it on real network. 
And what, you know, someone was playing a game, being affected by this uh, uh, Hungarian uh, novel, uh, that, you know, they thought about uh, Bacon, you know, Kevin Bacon. Uh, he was, you know, a random Hollywood star, not like uh, a prominent one, just like yeah, peripheral movies. <laughs> And, you know, they started, you know, to test it, that you can reach Kevin Bacon in six steps. You know, you have to figure out who co-starred with whom, and then you figured you figure out a chain of taking a random actor in Hollywood and reaching uh, Bacon. So they called up uh, Jaden, who was responsible of this website. You can play with the website. It's called the Oracle of Bacon. And uh, oh, so, somehow Bacon was at the center of it. And every, everyone was connected to, to Bacon through, on average, six degrees. And uh, so it, it's, it's funny that they could, you know, figure out this uh, small worldness. They could find that the clustering coefficient, which is a measure of this transitivity, is high. And the average path length is low on that Hollywood uh, network. So, and for them to show, um, the universality of this network characteristic, they had to test it beyond uh, this Hollywood uh, network uh, data set. So they went on to the power grid and uh, to the only at the time fully mapped nervous system, that of the C. elegant. And they tested it and they found that indeed uh, the clustering coefficient of these um, uh, networks were high compared to a network with uh, a random network of the same uh, degree and uh, number of nodes, and so was the power grid. So they kind of started stumbling upon funny universal uh, properties that were um, in protein-protein interaction in the cell and between genes, the way the proteins and metabolites interact in social systems, that is the list of friends of friends and in languages as in uh, words occurrences. So in the web, in the World Wide Web, the nodes are uh, web pages and the links are just, you know, the links that connect them. And the cell, uh, the nodes are the metabolites and the links are the chemical reactions. And in social systems, the nodes are the individuals and the ties are friendships, uh, professional relations, hate and love, what kind of uh, relations that you think of. And in language, nodes were words and links were uh, concurrences or semantic relationships. So these properties of small worldness were prevalent in all these networks. Okay, so they started seeing this universal behavior in uh, networks that uh, were no longer tied to that uh, Hollywood network they started off. At, at the same time, Barabasi uh, was, Albert Barabasi was thinking about these ideas of network and uh, he came across uh, Isaac Asimov's foundation as in a science fiction, uh, uh, read and he was the, the story revolves around you know the end of the galaxy so and it's it's you know the means into um, the dark ages and you know his protagonist thinks of a way to save the galaxy and in doing so he starts two groups he calls them foundations and puts them at at the ends of the galaxy to save the galaxy to spare it like uh, or to kind of decrease the number of uh, years dark years uh, that the galaxy is going to go through. And Barabasi was thinking, oh, okay, it's not going to work. It's not that if you know how two groups of people are working uh, on the, in, in, the, in the Milky Way that you're going to save it. It needs more. You need, you need to figure out how the full social network is uh, connected and who's, you know, uh, okay, I hope nothing. Okay. Uh, and who's, who's influencing whom and, uh, you know, uh, who's central to the decision making? So you need to, you need to have a full picture to predict the future, rather than you know figuring out two disconnected uh, group of people at the end of the galaxy. So he thought about it, and uh, the, the World Wide Web was also exploding in popularity, and people were thinking that okay, uh, we have this structure, and people were adding web pages to it, and it should have a random structure, and it should have hopefully at the, as, at the time as they, they thought that it should have this uh, random structure that Erdos and Rainey had had. You know, they randomly added links and you know, it should be a random network. But Barabasi and uh, Albert at the time were, you know, testing these ideas and they 
uh, looked at the subgraph uh, from uh, the web, and they found something uh, funny that neither Watts nor Strogas had you know, looked into, which was the actual degree distribution. So remember, we talked about that there are nodes which have a lot of connections and nodes which have very few. And this is something that you know, Watts and Strogas overlooked because they were after the small world effect in the networks. So they were studying clustering coefficient and the average path lengths, but there was this important property in the networks that they kind of overlooked, what, which was very important. And that, which is the existence of hubs, which are very central nodes in the structure, which are like sites like Google or Amazon. So Barabasi calls up Duncan Watts, hand me over the Hollywood data, okay? And um, he finds out that there are hubs in that, uh, in that data set, which are not explained by Erdos and Rainey, neither Watson Strogatz egalitarian uh, connections, because in, in egalitarian constructions, because in these two constructions or in uh, Erdos and Rainey and Watson's progress, you have no preference of where you put the link or what you connect to or whom you connect to. Uh, and if you look at the degree distribution, it's gonna be that of a Poisson or a binomial, which was not what was going on in real world networks. So they had, as uh, Barabasi would put it, that was a clip from, P k equal k to the minus gamma. That is the formula. That is the formula. You know, P k equal k to the minus gamma. That is the formula. So he stumbled upon something very important: <laughs> that the degree distribution does not follow up. So it's rather a power law, and a power law has very important uh, uh, implications on on how things uh, propagate. And he put out a. Um, a construction uh, with together with Albert, which we, they call the preferential attachment. So here networks are not fixed in size. I don't have a fixed number of nodes, but rather I start with a, with a couple and I add a node. And now this added node has to decide on whom to connect to. And the way they do, it's proportional to the degree of the uh, present nodes. So if, I'm, if I have this kind of network and I come in and add, a node and the node would want to decide with whom should I connect to and it's most likely going to connect to node A because it has the highest degree okay so it's kind of that's what we call preferential attachment or rich gets richer so whatever you have you're going to have more of it okay and if you look at the degree distribution you see that uh, there it's no longer a binomial and it is exactly what's happening in uh, real world networks, that there are few network, few nodes that have a lot of connections, which we call hubs, and a, lo a, a, lo a lot more which have different kind of degrees, okay? And so this shift of paradigm of static versus growing uh, and random versus scale-free and structure versus evolution is, you know, what kind of uh, ignited what's going to happen, what's going to come on next. So this, what we call the scale freeness, that there are things at all scales of degrees uh, or nodes at all scales of, or all degrees existence. And it's, uh, and it's present at all you know, stages of the formation process of a network. Okay, so how, what, what are hubs in the sense that networks that are, that have this kind of, uh, Topology in one way, they're neither uh, ordered, which are regular graphs, neither they are random, but they have these, you know, I mean, with the eye, you can detect that there's something funny about them. They have, you know, these nodes that are very central in the sense to the others. And this is a measure of centrality. Uh, so hubness is a measure of centrality, and I'm gonna explain it uh, in a second, but it has implications uh, on weakness and on uh, robustness. So it's, let's start with weakness. If I remove C, the network will shrink for sure, but it's not gonna be affected much, right? So if a router is not working somehow, somewhere in the physics department facing room 308, that's fine. <laughs> not a big deal, but it cannot be the central node, right? It cannot be A, right? Because everything else collapses. So. The repercussions on robustness are obvious because you know you can remove nodes, 
which are peripheral, nothing's going to happen. But uh, if you start removing these central nodes, then you would start seeing catastrophes. And you know these catastrophic uh, events are uh, happen, and you know they're measured on uh, networks. So the whole thing falls apart. So this measure of robustness, where you know you remove peripheral uh, things, and you know your full system remains functional, is the way the cells you know work under extreme conditions. Our you know uh, social systems, you know the human organization, you know we have famine, war. Uh, economic uh, crisis, everything, we're not collapsing, we're still doing fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you are. <laughs> and, you know, ecosystems are also disrupted by industrial development, and they're still, you know, robust. So in, in this, the way it robustness acts is the, in the cell, there are these regulatory and metabolic networks, and then social resilience, you know, you have this interwoven social web, and in economy, you have the financial and regulatory organization, minus Lebanon, the ecosystem, uh, species, and the way they interact. So, you know, robustness is somehow achieve, achieved uh, through interconnectivity. But then uh, a very brilliant student of Barabasi joined the lab, uh, and uh, she was very, you know, uh, well, she did her statistical physics with Professor Kushin, and she was, you know, very tough on statistical physics questions. And he, he handed her over the, the fact that there's a Google on, on the block or there's an Amazon. So in the construction that they had, Albert and Barabasi, you know, there's, an, there, there's a seniority. So more senior nodes are more likely to get richer, right? Because they're there, they have more node, they have more connection, a new node is more likely to connect to them. But, you know, there could be a new player in the game who can, you know, get all sorts of connections. And it doesn't have to do anything with seniority, with how long you've been in the game, with how long you've been a website or how long you've had friends. So there are the, you know, these nodes which have the knack for, you know, changing every social encounter into a lasting link or uh, every customer into a loyal partner or uh, uh, web surfers into addicts. So, you know, there's uh, something different that is more than seniority and, uh, that we have to account for in constructing networks. And uh, Bianconi introduced this notion of fitness. So there are people who are more likely to do that, you know, beyond the, the number of connections they have, they have fitness to, you know, being social, fitness to attracting more connections, etc. cetera. And uh, so when they started studying uh, the web, uh, the web uh, network, they started seeing that, you know, the number of links scaled as T to some power. So T is the time. So how long you've been in the game, unlike whatever the scale free uh, uh, construction predicts. So if I'm a node, I'm gonna grow my connection as a square root of time if I started with the scale free con construction. Whereas real data had this T to the power beta where beta was not half. So, the question was asked, okay, how do we, you know, how do we explain this uh, discrepancy between the scale-free net, the scale-free construction and whatever was been seen or this, you know, this new kid on the block gaining all the connections? And the answer had to come from quantum mechanics. So uh, Planck was studying uh, how objects emit light and heat. And, you know, he introduced this notion of quantum, okay? And uh, so Einstein picked it up and he called these, you know, quanta of energy photons and he predicted what we call the photoelectric effects. But there was no quantum mechanical derivation of, uh, of that uh, Planck's uh, construction. So Bose came into the game and he said, okay, you, the way you're doing it is wrong. You cannot think of, you know, these quanta of light as uh, distinguishable. So if you're in a rotating drum of the lottery, if you pick a number, you're gonna know what number you pick because it's labeled, okay? But you cannot treat these quanta of energy as distinguishable particles. You have to treat them as indistinguishable. So once you introduce that, you can uh, derive uh, Planck's uh, conclusion and uh, move on to explain what's happening in, in these systems. So if you have a gas with, which is at an ordinary temperature, the, the particles bounce into each other and they have different speeds and different energies associated with them, right? But if you kind of cool it down, and so 
the system is cooled down, uh, the atoms will settle into what we call the lowest energy state. And this was Bianconi's transformation. She thought of the node's fitness as the equivalent to the energy in the Bose-Einstein uh, formulation. So each node is now an energy level and the link is a particle in the gas. So if I have an energy level, which is now let's think about it as a web page, okay? And whether I connect to it, it has to do with its fitness, not only to its number of links. So if it has a high fitness and it has you know, a lower energy, then nodes are gonna, or nodes are gonna be connected to it. So uh, the, with this new construction, you know, they could uh, explain the scale freeness, but at the same time explain that, you know, there's no uh, priority to seniority. You know, you can be the node or the hub or the most central node of the, of the network without you being the most senior. And you know this exploded uh, full uh, uh, field of statistical physics of complex networks. So you see the Bose-Einstein con condensation of complex networks, statistical physics of real-world networks, statistical mechanics of complex networks. So these structures are ubiquitous. So real-world networks are ubiquitous. Where they're all over the place, but we only uh, take note of them when things go wrong. And <coughs> so. Some of you were not even born. <clears throat> I know some of my students don't even know the virus. I love you, the I love you virus. <clears throat> but you're young enough to have witnessed the pandemic. You know that COVID is a network that propagates over, over social networks. <clears throat> and you know, when trade gets into shock, so let's say the, 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 the war in uh, Ukraine now had you know, in, introduced a shock in the, in the trade network. And there are systemic risk in financial networks. We've, we're all witnessing the effects of them. And there are infra infrastructure, infrastructural catastrophic failures when like the full power grid, let's say, um, uh, fails or like epilepsy in the brain. So <laughs> you started seeing, you know, this flourishing of uh, the human disease network where you see there are links between phenotypes and genotypes and you start seeing how uh, disease are affecting each other's uh, and what we call the disease zone. Uh, and you know, the disease spread and interconnectivity. So there's a link between how connected we are and how fast disease spread and how central the node is to the disease in the way and, and the speed it, fat, it, it moves. And you know, this has repercussion on fragility. So the more, uh, if you attack, a if, if something happens at a fragile node or a central node, then the full system collapses. And then you started seeing, um, you know, the connectome or the network or the brain network uh, as a complex network. And it's been studied from that perspective. Uh, catastrophic failures in power grid. Uh, so this is the, the Italian power grid, which actually failed. Uh, and you know, the effects or the multi-layered effects of failure. So when the power grid fails, the metro would fail, the, you start, the banking system would fail. So you'd start seeing the avalanches of failures across networks, these what we call multi-layered networks. <coughs> start seeing, uh, uh, studying social networks on, uh, on social, on uh, virtual platforms, let's say data mining, and looking how people polarize on on uh, these platforms, and so political po polarization on Twitter is one example. Uh, again, the systemic risk in financial network. You can look at the financial network as you know as a network of interacting nodes and how things affect each others. Um, uh, and uh, again, the shock in trade. Uh, but this is practically what has been going on uh, in network science. And, you know, it's, it's a field that is growing uh, together with the use of uh, computational techniques and, you know, statistical physics and uh, graph theory. And uh, there are very big questions uh, of how to infer interaction matrices, matrices from data and how things propagate and how you find uh, uh, latent networks and dynamic consistence that you can, you can measure. Um, 
Now, what's going on locally and in-house is, uh, you know, our uh, in the in the Lebanese context is uh, first. I'm going to show an example of you know the recovery of the transmission network of COVID in Lebanon. So this, you see, it we kind of uh, worked out. Uh, you're supposed to see the reference, but I think it's going to show in the next slide. It's a collaboration between CAMS COVID group and uh, the CNRS and the Ministry of Public Health, the surveillance unit. So from the counts of uh, infections, uh, we kind of try to build the latent network of interaction between the localities. And uh, whatever you see on the poster is pretty much an abstraction of that spatial network, which is overlaid on real space. So these are nodes back on, you know, the ring topology and, you know, connections are uh, the links. And, you know, this is, uh, now that we have recovered the network or the networks that are involved in the transmission of the disease, you can look at the central nodes. So the central nodes are the nodes that are affecting the disease or their removal is pretty much very uh, essential in impeding the disease uh, speed in, the, in, in Lebanon. And you can see how these uh, uh, central nodes changed uh, over the course of the evolution of the disease in Lebanon. Um, I've been also looking at refugee migration. So you have a network of where the refugees start and where the refugee end. And from that, you recover, uh, let's say, a kind of a gravity type model of uh, refugee migration. You have a uh, refugee uh, moving from one place to the other based on you know, attraction and repulsion laws. Uh, we've looked at uh, vulnerability of the Lebanese power grid in the sense of you, know, you have attacks and you kind of model a uh, war scenario. So you, you kind of figure out which are the central nodes you kill them off and you see how the failure propagates. And let me just uh, show you uh, that I've, I've modeled uh, a full sen scenario of, uh, hopefully it will run, <laughs> of war in, in, in Lebanon. Now how, you know, targeting the infrastructure um, kills off or disconnects, let's say, uh, hospitals. So if you have, I'm going to tell you what, what I'm showing. So you, you start off with the, the road network in Lebanon, okay, the full road network in Lebanon, and you identify the central nodes. Okay, so which are the central node for this construction? And I hit it. So I kind of remove it from the network and there's an ensuing network that comes about. And for that network, I do this iteratively. I calculate the, network, the node with the highest centrality and I remove it. And with that, I measure the effect of loss of connectivity. Okay, and what I'm showing here is with each hit or targeting of the road network, you see the number of hospitals that are disconnected. You know, they're unreachable with this targeting. So you see loss of connectivity and at the same time, you know, loss of access, accessibility to uh, hospitals, uh, or uh, let's say in this case, in this case, of sh I'm showing hospitals. Um, so it's deployable beyond, you know, uh, let me go back to full screen mode. And going back to where I started off, uh, to this knowledge network, which involved uh, Euler, uh, Erdos, and you know all the sociologists and science fiction writers and uh, whomever was uh, in the slides, uh, we started off with a network of uh, these few people, and you know this diffusion of ideas and uh, this exchange between these nodes had changed the network into this, where Erdos and Rainey had become a hub. What's in Strogatz had also become a hub, and Albert and Barabasi had also become a hub. So, you know, it's a network of knowledge which was changed by the dynamics of a process on the network. So, we've kind of shown a dynamics, a dynamical process on the network, which, has, which is the diffusion of ideas in the network and how it shaped the network and changed it into uh, this kind of, uh, you know, scale free network of collaboration, uh, scientific collaboration. So these are the references of the talk and uh, part of the parts which involve the crickets 
And uh, Barabasi is stating that that is the formula are taken from uh, the documentary Connected, The Power of Six Degrees, which has an alternative title of How Kevin Bacon Cured Cancer, so, uh, which I advise you to attend. And thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So I think uh, we will open the floor for questions from the Zoom audience first. If anybody has any questions, you can please okay. unmute yourself and ask the question because we cannot see you see the chat. Okay, maybe I'll just open the chat. Okay, we have the chat as well if you want to type. I'll wait 10 seconds. No questions from Zoom. So questions from the audience, anyone? Yes. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Who are you? <laughs> I'm sorry. And uh, thanks very much, Sarah, for the talk. What is uh, Tare, are you on Zoom? Yes, I'm on Zoom. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was removed from the network in, in the room. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I'm very curious to know in the COVID-19 paper that you just showed us, how did you reconstruct the latent network just from uh, incidence numbers? Uh, yes, so Tore, that's a, that's a good question, which I kind of try to hide, to hide under the rugs. But uh, we, we relied on what we call the autoregressive model. So you have the counts and the counts at previous times in the same locality and in the, the neighboring localities. Okay. So we kind of try to uh, using uh, maximum likelihood to figure out what kind of uh, interaction exists between them. And um, I, since you've asked about the work, the paper is on archive and you can follow the details mathematically to, uh, to find out how we recovered the network. Uh -huh. But it actually relied on a, an autoregressive model. Okay, I'll take a look at the details. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sarah. Hi. Yes, Thank you for this talk. Uh, I have a question. It's a bit philosophical, maybe. So we human beings like to see things connected. Yes. I mean, some people talk about number seven. We see it everywhere. Now we are giving an example of number six. Uh, even like in political or economical uh, events, we can we usually connect two events with even maybe less than six nodes or less than four nodes. Now, in a network that we built, like for example, for an electric, electrical system or an internet system, we can predict because we built this network, we know what will happen if one of the chain broke, we know what would be the consequence of that. So we know how things are connected. But in things like that are like social or economical, I mean, how, how do you measure that, that these two events are connected or not? How, how, because if you have an answer to this, you can then predict what will happen if you break the system or if some, noise happen. So, I mean, my question is really about how you measure connectedness yeah, of so two things in That's in a very good question, Ahmed. So, in, in the examples that I've uh, mentioned, uh, we've, I, I put in the, prob the examples with, with uh, uh, social network connections over like Facebook or Twitter. So, things are connected the way they are. So, you, you, you have a measure of connectedness through, you know, the friends, the friends list. And, uh, that's a measure of the network. Uh, and the way things are used is, um, you know, in the predictability is that, you know, you've identified the nodes uh, that is central. So, you know, whatever is gonna, the, whatever this person is gonna utter is gonna, you know, diffuse over the whole network. In that sense, there is a, there is a measure, there is some sort of predictability of, you know, spreading processes over networks. And in, one, in other ways you can, you know, uh, disconnect that uh, node and you know shut it off and you know you'd you'd interrupt the flow of information or one way or the other but uh, i would i would stress on them being a, a representation of whatever is happening on the social uh, on, the, on the virtual domain rather than on the real real physical because as you said a measure of connectedness or the definition of connectedness is not kind of straightforward. We can also think of, let's say, network of collaborations. Collaborations is kind of straightforward. You collaborate with the person 
or you cite a person. So these are, you know, their social connections, which are straightforward to understand rather than, you know, abstract connections of uh, friendships, which, you know, untie and uh, disconnect and change over this other course of time. Should I read it? Uh, no, okay. I, yeah, okay, so the question says, initially, why was it predicted that nodes with more seniority have a higher preference, rich get richer concept? Is it purely mathematical? Uh, it's it's by construction, Garo, because uh, if you have if you start with five nodes, that uh, one of them has, uh, let's say, four connections, that whatever node you add is going to preferentially choose the one with the highest connection. So, and then you keep on adding the ones that are old in the game, that they started the game early on, they would have higher number of connections. So if someone decides to join the game, uh, they're gonna join the one with higher number of connection who happens to be the more senior. Uh, so, okay. Right, so from uh, what I understood, it seems that these networks are mostly uh, time evolving uh, entities, if you want. And so the question is, uh, in the real world, most of the data is time series. And I assume that this would be obviously used in order to reconstruct a network. However, what, do you, what can you say about the forecasting power of these networks and how much do they help us in not only using what we know to construct and understand the network, but also to predict future events from it. Yeah, this kind of ties up to uh, Ahmed's question on, you know, the whatever you have in the network is, uh, you know, the topology tells you a lot about connectedness and it tells you a lot about uh, the speed of propagation. Let's say you have a rumor you want it to spread over a network. The topology tells you that, you know, this is how much time it's, it's going to take for you to spread, for, for the rumor to spread. And uh, talking about time series, you know, a very important question of, you know, you haven't, you know, and thought it started with the question, you have some measure of incidence. Do you have infection? How is it that you recover a matrix? So you have to have, you know, a, a sort of a, either a model with which things are interacting and then you start doing the inference or you do the, this uh, Bayesian inference or non-parametric approaches. So once you have these networks, there's a lot to be you know, uh, taken from them. And in terms, let's say, uh, if you want a rumor to stop, you'd better disconnect your uh, neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, so we know that the goal of science is to generalize. We need to find a model that's complex and easy to understand at the same time. Uh, don't you think when we have a lot of agents and a lot of nodes in the network, the understanding becomes very complex and we cannot like come up with a idea or a concept from this interaction? Uh, it's kind of on the contrary. What networks have, they encapsulate information that kind of can be Easily teased. If you're following individually what people are doing, then okay, that might be you know a lot to process. But when you, when you see how the network or the collective is uh, you know interacting to produce uh, a complex behavior, or let's say uh, you know the the chirps of the the insects, there inter there there's a lot of uh, variabilities between these insects, but the interaction allowed us to figure out that there's a synchronous state. Or the fireflies, when they fire, they, you know, there's the network and it allows you to figure out that there's synchronicity. And this is what you're after, you know, this macroscopic measure. And you somehow blur out the details of what the individual is doing. You care about how is it that they're kind of collaborating or uh, fighting against each other to produce the macroscopically observed behavior. Yeah, so if you, if, yeah, if you think of fireflies, there's, let's say, a frequency at which they're flashing lights. So when they do it in uh, unison, then it's synchronous. So, and the same thing with the chirps. 
when they're you know doing the chirps together you hear one sound you don't hear multiple sounds though they uh, there are hundreds of thousands of them you hear it you hear one thing so that's uh, that's what we call synchronicity uh, what happens to the time evolution of the system is if some of the nodes are constrained to move in a specific manner? Uh, <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, constraint definitely change dynamics. And um, yeah, they, they, they have effects on dynamics. So they change the topology. Is there a way to determine like the extent to which um, the time evolution, like whether it becomes increases or decreases? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So let's say, uh, you know, someone who's, uh, who's got COVID and uh, they were moving like freely on campus and then you, <laughs> you get their positive test and you tell them, okay, you just have to uh, quarantine for the week or something. So it, it definitely uh, slows down the infectivity of uh, that person and it has uh, effects on the dynamics. And that has to do with the structure of the network. So uh, the, way th the way people are connected so that's what we call the adjacency matrix. And the number of people that uh, the person has is what we call the degree matrix. So the combination of both gives you a measure of what we call the spectral gap or how fast things move over the network. So killing off a node, you know, not literally, but you know, <laughs> shutting it off uh, is definitely can be measured, the effects on speeds for sure. I have another question, if you don't mind. <laughs> Um, what how, to what to which extent does the evolution change if, uh, for example, the nodes are themselves uh, embedding other networks? Yani if we somehow have a nested system. Okay, that's, it's a very important question. That's what, what we call multi-layered networks. So uh, I gave the example of you know, the power grid being connected to the metro station, being connected to Shubat. Uh, uh, the banking system, the ATMs. So yes, these, the, you know, the, the inter interconnectedness between the different networks make dynamics or make the evolution of stuff more vulnerable. Because if something crashes on one level, on one level, it's gonna uh, cascade and it's gonna be catastrophic. Uh, <laughs> and that's course graining. Yes, sorry, then one way or the other. Is, uh, is the field of, of uh, network science considered like closed or like there's many open questions now um, in the field? Uh, no, it's a, what they, is one? we have a lot of open questions and I, one, a lot of important questions have to do with inference of these networks. So you have data, but you don't know how things are interacting. So there's latent networks. So the question of network reconstruction from dynamics is a very big question. You know, that's uh, a lot of a lot of uh, math is involved and a lot of statistical physics is also there. The question of detecting communities over networks and how what is it that makes a community over a network is also another very important question. Um, and there are questions which have to do with uh, you know uh, taking these networks to the micro canonical or ma or canonical ensembles in uh, statistical physics and you know imposing constraints over nodes and which are of very uh, also important uh, aspect of natural science. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one That's is <laughs> <laughs> very short one. <laughs> one Barabasi focused. <laughs> When Barabasi focused on the structure of networks and the introduction of hubs, uh, did that completely invalidate the ideas of weak links and the six nodes idea? No, they're retained. They're retained. They're retained. So scale-free networks do have, uh, you know, high clustering and low average path lengths, but they also have a power law degree distribution, okay. which the construction of Watson and Soroga still have. And speaking of power laws, we we saw many connections to statistics, statistical physics. And I mean, is there are there similar ways in which we can um, determine these exponents, or doesn't necessarily? Um, okay, so the degree distribution is one power law. There yes. are also other kind of the distributions that emerge in uh, complex systems, which are power law related and. Uh, 
power laws, as you know, from statistical physics emerge at phase transitions. So exactly. there are these links between, you know, phase transitions and network, but not, not quite so, because, you know, it's not that, you know, the network is shifting between randomness and uh, scale freeness. This property of power law is kind of governing the formation from start to end. Okay. So it's not that it's transitioning into mm -hmm. uh, scale free okay. state. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Hi, Zoom. At the start, you said you wanted to prove uh, if it's all graph theory or is just data or is it its own thing? Network no, I, science. I, I didn't say I'm going to prove. Only reach I said that it's kind of different because uh, we're dealing with these real world networks and you know you're dealing with properties and uh, transitions that had to do with statistical physics. So it's a kind of a, a, a coupling between statistical physics and graph theory and probability theory in, in applications to real world networks. So it's not quite, we're kind of cousins, yeah. I mean, don't so, take it as a feud. <laughs> so they go, go hand in hand, okay. <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? Okay, maybe I'll ask final question. So uh, just out of curiosity, so, so is there like a simplest possible physical model of a network system that we still do not know how to model mathematically using any of those? Uh, there, there are always surprises that keep on invalidating constructions. Yeah, anyway, the, the model of Albert and Barabasi said that, okay, we have it all, we have the power law, but then they, you know, this uh, rich gets richer is not, you know, the, it violated, it, seniority was violated by the addition of, you know, how, how these newcomers attracted things. Uh, for the moment, it's like the Bianconi and Albert is kind of, you know, uh, not the holy grail, but it's kind of, okay, it's, it persisted a lot of tests, but uh, there will always, there are always, you know, these outliers that. Uh, uh, okay. we, we, we don't know of an actual example that breaks it. Uh, not that I know of, okay. but. Uh, All right. Thank you. There's can a I, chat. Can I uh, give an anecdote or maybe uh, bounce off one of the two of the themes that you mentioned in your talk, Sarah? Yes, please. Um, one of them is community detection and the other one is small world. So I don't know. I always uh, tell people uh, abroad that Lebanon is a weird situation sociologically because everybody, I mean, I would assume that the uh, average path length between people is not six in Lebanon. It's more like two or three. I mean, everybody knows someone who knows everyone else, kind of. But at the same time, there are very clearly defined communities. So it's a paradox where there are separated communities, but at the same time, they are extremely linked through network effects. I don't know. I'd really love to see a sociological study of that thing in Lebanon and really kind of show people how connected they are despite how you know they perceive it to be otherwise maybe i don't know i, I can tell the story of how we got to meet Tarek. <laughs> Tarek reached out to uh professor klusen who connected him to a very good example yeah connected him to dr tuma dr tuma then connected him to amara amara then connected Tarek to me who ended up being my cousin <laughs> so and though we didn't know the connection so yeah all right so i guess no more questions we can thank the speaker again thank you very much thank you. Sarah, for Thank you all. Shukran Jazeelan.